back everyone if you're watching this on YouTube thank you for being here if you're on Twitch then also thank you for still being here um, so let's just continue so lecture 9 um, was about uh, primer design um, so the first part was about polymerase chain reaction right so um, have what do we need for PCR um, yeah, so we need water nucleotides primers template DNA and a master student to do it for us um, but we also talked about what is a good primer and when is a primer a primer right because primers need to be a certain length and they need to have a certain binding capacity by having like an AC GT uh, kind of uh, so an a ATGC composition and we also talked about advanced primers so that you can do multiplex PCR um, where you have or where you're not amplifying using a single pair of primer uh, but you're using multiple pairs of primers um, we talked about universal primers um, and semi-universal primers if you want to amplify a piece of uh, a virus um, but not just from one strain but multiple strains um, so then you can use things like universal primers um, I think the example that we did there was HPV, something like that. Um, but then hey, we also have GASMERS, so if you don't have a DNA sequence available, um, then based on a known protein sequence, uh, you can still design primers for your animal, um, which doesn't have a genome sequence available. Uh, and you do this by back translation, right? So you look at the amino acid sequence, and then you code the amino acids back to their DNA equivalent, um, which of course is not perfect. Um, so Gesmer primers are generally longer than standard primers to make them still bind or have to still give them this the, the binding properties that you need. <coughs> So when we talk about PCR, um, PCR comes in three steps. So know that the first step is denaturation, um, where we heat up our sample to go from double-stranded DNA into single-stranded DNA. And then the next step is lowering the temperature a little bit so that the primers can bind. Um, so hey, this is generally like 90 degrees Celsius. Annealing happens at around uh, 60 something degrees. Um, I think the the, the the temperatures were mentioned in the lecture um, and then had the, the primers bind to the DNA and then in the next step we um, put the temperature up to like 70 degrees Celsius and then the uh, the, uh, um, the the DNA polymerase starts amplifying the, the DNA and DNA polymerase only starts amplifying DNA when when we have these primers there so when when there's double stranded DNA so um, we talked about PCR, right? So when we have our gene of interest that we are trying to PCR out, then of course in the first cycle we get like two copies, four copies, eight copies and 16 copies. Um, let me uh, just mute, mute myself. I don't know what going on with my voice but um, so hemp in, in, in PCR we do an exponential amplification hey, which means that the number of cycles that we use uh, we can kind of estimate how much uh, product we're going to get um, which is 2 to the power of the number of cycles that we do um, we also showed the first few cycles in detail right because this is just a kind of stylized picture and um, this is what we would like to happen um, but of course this is not how it exactly happens um, but hey, if you're interested in that then please watch back lecture number nine um, so have we we also talked about the length of the primer and the uniqueness and the fact that have when the primer gets longer uh, you need to have a higher melting and annealing temperature right but there's this trade-off because the longer your primer, the, the higher the chance that it's unique, um, but also the longer the primer, the higher the annealing temperature. Um, and then you, you end up in this situation where there has to be enough temperature difference between the annealing step and the elongation step. Um, and have we talked about things like melting temperature? So the melting temperature is the temperature at which half of the DNA is single-stranded and half of the DNA is still double-stranded. So the the melting temperature for genomic DNA generally tends to be at around 93 degrees Celsius but of course for for primers this is much lower because primers are a lot shorter and we also talked about annealing temperature so the annealing temperature is the temperature at which the primer starts binding to the genomic DNA 
Um, have we talked about multiplex, PCR, semi-universal primers, Gesmers, and many more. And I also showed you in which fields primer design skills are required, right? So if you are ever going to do real-time PCR or um, studying population polymorphisms using microsatellites or AFLP markers, and then you, you use primers. Um, and we also talked about um, internal probe design. But and the most important things to, in, to remember about this whole lecture is, is that if you design primers, you have to achieve the appropriate hybridization specificity. So it has to be unique, right? You only want to amplify one part of the genome. And you have to be able to do this stably, uh, which means that you have to have enough difference in the different temperatures um, for the whole process to be able to kind of cycle through these three different temperature levels, right? Because if the primer is too long and your annealing temperature is around 70 degrees Celsius, right? Then the annealing temperature is the same as the temperature used by the polymerase and then stuff starts going wrong because then, then the stability doesn't hold. And stability also has to do, of course, with the number of ATs versus GCs yeah, because you want to have your primer to bind very tightly to the DNA. And of course, yeah, this has to do with um, the template DNA and the, the ACGT content uh, of, of, the, of the template DNA as well. Um, to remember, right, if you design primers, um, never design primers on repeated sequences um, because if you design primers on repeated sequences, then of course they're not going to be unique. Um, and so primers cannot contain repeats themselves either. And so we want to get rid of them. And for that, we can use a tool like repeat masker, right? So you can use repeat masker standard, or you can use it directly in ensemble. So when you export your sequence from an ensemble, you have the option to mask your sequence, uh, which means that it kind of blocks out areas which are repeated across the genome, and it blocks out areas which are of very low, um, low variability. Right? If you have ATC, 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 then it will block out this region so that you don't design primers by accident to these kinds of sequences. So in lecture 10, we talked about databases. So we talked about some terminology about databases. So what is a uh, uh, things like SQL and these kinds of things. Um, I try to explain to you guys why we need databases, because they have advantages over just storing data on, on your hard drive. And they allow things like sharding, which makes them much faster, and you can do indexing. Um, and so no sharding means that you put it on different sites. So you have one database, which is not just local on one position on the earth, but which also has, for example, the same database, but then in Japan, so that people in Japan can also use it. And then you have indexing. So indexing means that you, you look through a column, see what's there, and already start uh, anticipating on future queries um, and by building an, an index so that you can quickly find back stuff in the database. Uh, we talked about normalization of data within a database um, and had the organization of a database so that you can search generally in different ways and had that you have and we, we had an overview of all kinds of important databases in, in uh, bioinformatics and biology um, has, so you need to know that what can we use ensemble for right what what is in PubMed. Um, but also that there are databases like the PDB, which focus entirely on proteins, um, that you have dbSNP, which only focuses on storing single nucleotide polymorphisms in humans. Um, and during this lecture, we also talked about Biomart, and I did a Biomart example using um, our African goat data, I think. Um, and Heb Biomart is a connector for R and for other programming languages so that you can automatically query uh, many of these important databases in bioinformatics so that you don't have to go to the database to the website and start clicking on it and downloading stuff. No, Biomart allows you to write code which will retrieve data for you, which of course makes your research much more reproducible. Um, so a little bit more about the normalization, right? So normalization of data means that instead of storing the full student name in a single column, hey, you can break it down to a more granular level saying that no, every name has a first name, middle name, last name, right? And then that, that's easier because now we can see that all of the students have the same middle name, which of course is not obvious from the data that we used to have in, in a single column. 
Um, I told you about over decomposition, so when you start chopping up things that actually should not be chopped up, right? Uh, when you have a phone number, then store the phone number in a single column. Don't start doing smart things like storing region codes, area codes, and then phone extensions, um, because these might change over time, um, plus that no one's interested in... Um, had the, no one's ever going to do a query, give me everyone who has this... Um, phone extension, right? Because that's not a very uh, good thing. We also talked about things which go wrong in, in databases, right? So for example, uh, duplicate data and not so much duplicate data, but the worst thing is duplicate data, which is named differently, right? So if you have fifth standard and fifth standard, once you write it with, uh, the, let, uh, with the number five TH, and the next time you write it with fifth, um, then of course, um, the database does not know that these two things are the same, right? So it is a duplicate data, um, but it, it's even worse because it's duplicate data, but it's also inconsistent. And this is the thing that databases help you solve by using things like foreign keys, right? So in this case, you would say, no, the standard is a foreign key, which points to another table where all of the different standards are described. So we had a bunch of slides about this and, and you don't have to know all of the normal forms, um, but know that there are things like over decomposition and that, that generally the, the, the database functions best when data is more or less stored in a normalized fashion. All right, so in lecture 11, we talked about sequence analysis. So have we, we know that sequences change during the course of evolution. And so you have point mutations where a single base pair gets modified, um, but we also have insertions and deletions. And to make it even worse, we also have this kind of xenologs, and so genes which are transferred from one bacteria to the other. Um, but had generally, these are considered the three main forms of, of sequence variation uh, during evolution. Um, and then, of course, we talked about the uh, homology trick, right? So that since all of all life on the planet more or less comes from one single event where life existed and then everything branched out, and we can use homology uh, to kind of infer the function of a protein, right? If we know that a, a certain protein is transporting oxygen in humans, and then if we find a protein in, in mice, uh, which has a very similar... Um, um, which has a similar, very similar sequence, and then we can also assume that this protein in mouse probably also start, uh, will transport oxygen, right? So that's, and the homology trick works because it's a single tree um, which kind of grows up from, from the early beginnings. Um, when we talked about sequence analysis, we talked a great deal about sequence alignment, Right, so because that's kind of the fundal, uh, fundamental algorithm in, in, in uh, bioinformatics and, and that there are two major variants of alignment. One is global alignment and the other one is local alignment. Um, so global alignment tries to match the entire string to the other string. Um, so it is more likely to insert gaps at the beginning. Um, but when we, um, I think something went wrong with this picture. Yeah, this is this is wrong. Um, please please ignore this slide and and look at the slide in the lecture. I think I, I copied the same one for. Um, but the local alignment tries to find the optimal substring, while global alignment tries to match the whole thing. Um, so yeah, yeah. So this is this is just. I, I copy pasted the same thing more or less twice. Um, but then look at the original slide in lecture 11 and then know that there's a difference between global alignment and local alignment. And local alignment generally is used when you have very short sequences which you want to compare towards a genome, while global alignment is used when you have um, complete viral genomes that you want to align together. Um, so. Um, we talked about sequence analysis a lot, and um, when we talked about it, we also talked about scoring functions, right? So that to compare if two sequences are similar, we need to kind of have a mathematical definition of similarity, right? So the, the most basic definition um, that we had or that we could come up with is just the percentage of matches. So how many base pairs match? And so you get a plus one for each base pair that matches and for every mismatch you, you get a minus one penalty um, in a way. Right, so percentage of matches is just seven out of twelve base pairs match, um, but you can also add um, this this um, 
plus one minus one system. Um, and this plus one minus one system can then be extended with a linear gap penalty, which means that when you open up a gap in one sequence, um, then opening up a gap of two compared to opening a gap of four, the gap of four is twice as expensive as the gap of two. Um, but since in biology we know that insertions and deletions are very common, uh, we nowadays almost always use an affine gap penalty. That means that you get that you have a high penalty threshold for opening a gap, but then when you make the gap bigger, you don't put that much penalty on there, right? So opening a gap might be a score of minus one, but then going from a gap which is from one y to a gap that is two y, you give a 0 0.1 um, penalty. Right, and going from two to three again, you get a 0 0.1 penalty. So, and this is this this allows you to do much better alignments uh, when you use this affine gap penalty. So, know what the difference is between a linear gap penalty and an affine gap penalty. And so, the, the the main difference is that in a linear gap penalty, um, you you score for every for every x base pairs that you make the gap bigger, you get a plus x. Uh, penalty. While in an affine gap penalty, you don't have that. Opening a gap is expensive, but extending a gap, so making the gap bigger, is relatively cheap. Um, and I want you guys to be able to calculate the percentage of matches on DNA and protein level. So when I give you one of these um, kind of amino acid codon wheels, um, you should be able to read the amino acid codon wheel. And, and if I give you two DNA sequences, you should be able to say, well, okay, DNA wise, it matches seven out of 12. Um, but on protein level, we see that there is a nine out of, uh, no, a four out of four. Right, because of course we come in codons, um, so three letters of DNA become one amino acid. Um, but be able to use these things. So I, I think we did a small um, example in the in the lecture as well. We also have to take care in DNA alignment that we score transitions and transversions differently. So uh, uh, because hey, when you when you look at DNA, then it's um, we had this. Um, figure where um, we show that when you go from an A to a T that this is relatively common because the, um, the, the chemical structure of the A um, base pair looks very similar to the chemical structure of the T base pair, right? So by using electromagnetic radiation or, or nuclear radiation, um, it is very commonly, uh, it, it's a very common occurrence for an A to change into a T. Right, but an A almost never changes to a C, or not almost never, but when this happens, um, it's called a transversion, and a transversion is, is very uncommon. And the same thing happens in proteins, because in proteins we have pro, uh, amino acids which have very similar side chains. So uh, changing a, 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 a lysine by a glycine is a very small change because the, uh, because the side chain is the same. Right? And then we have something which is this substitution probability matrix uh, where we talked about the Blossom matrix and the PAM matrix. Um, and these matrices, they try to catch this fact that um, when we have a, a substitution of one amino acid by a different one, so we have kind of a mutation there, um, it tries to score um, some more heavily or it, it penalizes some more heavily than others. Right? If we have a, 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 a a positively charged amino acid being changed by a positively charged amino acid, then this is a relatively common occurrence, but a positive amino acid which gets changed by a negative amino acid, um, that of course has a, has a much bigger penalty associated with it. Um, know what BLAST is, basic local, uh, uh, local uh, alignment, um, and know about cluster W, um, so alignment, multiple sequence alignment, uh, where we try and align multiple sequences together. And cluster W, when we talk about cluster W, we talk about how to detect conserved residues. Um, we can find conserved regions, but we can also find patterns in our amino acid structure. And when all of the amino acids are, for example, positively charged, and then they don't all have to be the same, and but then still there might be a pattern saying that for the functioning of this protein, it is very important that at this position, you have a positively charged uh, residue or positively charged amino acid. 
All right, so lecture 12 was all about gene expression analysis. Again, we did more or less the exact same thing as what we showed in lecture one, where we looked at microarrays, right? So hey, creating oligoarrays um, had no where bioinformatics is involved. Um, you don't have to know all of the different um, things, right? But know that a TIFF file is just an image file with these dots on the microarray, hey, which can be red, green, or yellow. Um, cell file is this, um, proprietary format from uh, Affymetrix, um, which stores um, data about microarrays in kind of a compressed way. I talked about normalization. Hey, why do we normalize during uh, microarray analysis? And this is uh, because the dyes have various varying behavior, right? The, the green dye has a much higher dynamic range than the red dye, um, but there's also variation during the hybridization, like the, the, the surrounding temperature or the surrounding humidity has a big influence on how well your sample hybridizes to a microarray. And of course there's variance in the manufacturing. If I buy an array now and I buy the same array in like five years, um, then of course the, the the quality of the array might be might be different, right? Because the technique gets better. So the, the array that I do today is not directly comparable to the array that I do in like five years. So to kind of get rid of these effects, right? These are all effects that introduce variance into the into the sample, and we want to get rid of that. And that is why we do use normalization. Besides normalization of microarrays, we also almost always look at the log to ratio of a microarray, and this is because of this varying behavior of the dyes, um, where hey, we want to have kind of a linear scale, saying that if I go from zero to one, um, then hey, this needs to be the same as going from uh, zero to minus one, right? So it's a it's a it's a transformation where we go and hey, we divide the the green dye intensity by the red dye intensity and then we do the log two and this is just to prevent the fact from having a, if you have one divided by two that is different from two divided by one um, and I think the slides actually in the lecture explain it pretty well why you want to use it. Um, when we talked about gene expression, I showed you guys that you can do it using t-tests, but also you can do it using ANOVA tests, right? So a t-test is really nice when you have two groups, um, but when you have, for example, two different groups, two different tissues, and you have two different factors, for example, low concentration of, uh, of medicine and high concentration of medicine, then you are forced to do an ANOVA test, right? Because an ANOVA test allows you to adjust for covariates. Um, it allows you to put up a model saying that my intensity of the probe is related to the condition in which the probe was measured, uh, plus the, the, the thing that I did to the sample, uh, plus the type of mouse where the sample was taken from. Right? And you can't do that with a t-test, because a t-test only compares two conditions, so condition A versus condition B, and does not allow you to, to control for other factors. Um, here again, I mentioned multiple testing, right? So the type one error is calling a gene significantly changed, even if it's just by chance. Um, so type one errors can be avoided by Bonferroni correction. And the type two errors is uh, when you say that a gene is not significantly changed or not significantly different between two samples that you have, uh, while it actually is. And you can only optimize for one of the two. Um, so you can say, I want to have a minimal amount of type one errors but then of course your type two errors go up um, and you can say I want to minimize the type two errors but then the type one errors go up. So that's the kind of trade-off that you have to do. Um, and this one can be avoided by Bonferroni correction. The type two error is uh, Bagnemini Hoogberg false discovery rate adjustment. We also talked about gene ontology, right? Gene ontology is uh, a common terminology we use to describe the things like the cellular component where the gene is found, right? So a gene can be active in a nucleus, a gene can be active in the cytosol, or it can be active outside of the cell, so that's exported. Um, but also we have a common 
nomenclature, so a common terminology for things like biological processes and molecular function. And this allows us to do these over-representation tests, right? Imagine that I do a microarray analysis and I find 50 genes which are different um, between the two animals that I look at. Um, then we can do these tests looking to see if a certain cellular component is overrepresented in these 50 genes, right? If all of these 50 genes are nuclear genes, uh, then of course we, we hypothesize that there might be something going on in the nucleus. But if all of these 50 genes or 40 out of 50 genes are located in the mitochondria, then we might assume that no, the mitochondria are the thing where, where it goes wrong or where the animal has an issue. And the same thing for CAG, right? Using CAG, we can actually it provides these map of different pathways in uh, in different species and we can actually overlay our gene expression data onto a CAG pathway to see if everything in a pathway is upregulated or if a whole pathway is downregulated um, based on the tissues that we're looking at. Again here we talked about similarity right because we have to have a mathematical different definition of what is similar um, and of course it's different from when you look at uh, when you compare DNA sequences to each other or when you compare protein sequences to each other when you compare expression profiles to each other um, there are three different distance measurements that you can use right so the Manhattan distance is just the absolute difference between um, the, the sample one and sample two and then across all of the probes that you measured the Euclidean difference is more or less the same but it's not the absolute difference it's the difference to the power of two you add up all of these differences and then you take the square root of the total difference and then the Minowski distance is more or less the distance generalization for this where you can choose your own m factor right so an m factor of two means that you have Euclidean distance but you can also have an m factor of three and why do we sometimes use Minowski distance because sometimes we want to put more weight on large differences, right? Because um, 0 0.1 to the power of uh, 3 is, of course, much less than 2 to the power of 3. And so by choosing a higher M factor, you're focusing more on extreme differences compared to small changes which are globally across. Um, but three different distance measurements to express how similar or how different two expression profiles are in animals or in mice or in plants. Again, we want to build a tree, right? Because we want to see which things belong together, which things are not belonging together. And then we also talked about this clustering. Um, so hey, there's a difference between single linkage. So if you have a group or a, a group of two profiles and a other group of also two profiles, then the single linkage is based upon the two most similar elements within the groups. If we look at complete linkage, then we look at the two most dissimilar um, elements and at the distance between the two groups is then based on the two most dissimilar elements. And then we have average linkage, which is also called OPGMA. Um, and then we look at the distance between two clusters is taken as the average of all distances between pairs of objects X in A and objects Y in B. And that is the mean distance between the elements in each of the two clusters. So average linkage is the best, um, but it is relatively expensive to compute when you have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of elements, right? If cluster one has a hundred elements, cluster two has a hundred elements, then you have to compare all of them, right? So if you compare one versus a hundred, the second one versus 100, the third one versus 100. So you, you do like a massive amount of comparison. So eh, UpGMA is the most computationally expensive method. And that is why sometimes people look at single, single linkage and complete linkage um, because it is relatively cheap because you only have to do one comparison. We also talked about where you can get free microarray data. Um, yeah, so go to Gene Expression Omnibus if you want to get free microarray data to work on and write a scientific publication without spending any money. Um, and the same thing you can do at ArrayExpress. Um, the massive advantage of ArrayExpress is that they have curated, re-annotated archive data, um, which is of very high quality because someone looked at it and made sure that the sample that was submitted is really the sample that people said that it was. And that's not the case for, for Gene Expression Omnibus. Gene Expression Omnibus, anyone can upload data, even me. So that means that there's no curation going on. 
lecture 13 standards for analysis um, very interesting lecture I think um, because have we talked about different uh, biological file formats like the comma separated file but also FASTA files so sequencing files um, uh, or, or files holding sequence data then we have FASTQ which is the standard output for DNA sequencers nowadays which contains DNA sequence data but also DNA quality data we looked at the GFF format which is the, uh, the format for storing genomic features um, and we have the VCF format for storing variations relative to a reference genome and we also looked at the PET map format which is a very common format when you do association analysis um, so it, it stores variations on one side and other also phenotypic measurements on the other side so it's kind of the common file format used in association analysis like genome-wide association and, and QTL mapping we talked about difference in testing strategies so if you write code as a bioinformatician then use test to test the code that you've written right so a unit test means that you test the smallest unit so you've written, so you've written a function so you you throw all kinds of different input to the function and then you see if what the function gives you is actually correct based on on what you wanted to do with the function right so regression testing is different because regression testing means that you take the code from someone else and then just throw in data see what comes out and then you start modifying the code but you make sure that every time that you make a modification that you run the test and make sure that for the same input still the same output is produced and then we also had some words about test driven development where you where you develop software using this iterative approach where you say I I want to add a new feature so I write a test that tests the new feature the test initially fails then I start writing code I then run the test again and if the test succeed then I have successfully implemented that feature and I continue with adding a new feature right it so it's it's writing tests and then writing code to pass the test we also discussed all kinds of different types of documentation um, so we talked about user documentation and um, um, documentation which is written beforehand uh, we talked about um, code documentation and so know that there are different types of documentation for different audiences and so you're not only writing code for yourself but you're also writing um, documentation that belongs to the code like a tutorial for people that will use your code um, but you also write things like function description so saying that this function has five parameters um, and these parameters um, had the first parameter needs to be uh, an integer between 0 and, and 100 um, and so there's different types of documentation for different groups of stakeholders uh, when you are writing software last lecture of last week I think that's also one of the most fun lectures because I always like doing it we talked about citations why do we cite stuff in in science and what's the use of it um, we talked about things like web of science so if it's not in web of science it's not science uh, we talked about Google Scholar and ResearchGate and things like H indexes and I indexes um, we talked about scientific reference management and that you should do some form of scientific reference manager uh, management using a reference manager like EndNote or Mendeley and then I showed you a difference between distributed and centralized version control right so that's that's it's not directly related to literature management um, but version control is related to kind of software management right because you you want to be able to go back in time uh, to rerun your analysis and this has to all do with reproducible research right so in theory lecture 14 should have been called reproducible research instead of literature um, but have we talked about citations which are there to make sure that um, when you claim something that you point to the guys that actually did the research for it um, have we talked about reference managers which allow you to kind of easily include references when needed um, and version control is there so that your code is also versioned so you can go back in time um, because of course code changes um, and sometimes you need to rerun an analysis as if it was 2017. All right, so with that first 
exam question, example exam question. So if you throw the answers in chat, then we can go to the next one and we can all go home early. So what is the difference between pre-mRNA and mature mRNA? Um, I have a sound effect for that. Like, let's do the audio and then just do crickets. So I'm just going to continue this sound effect until anyone answers the question. Um, All right, question uh, answer number one. It's not spliced. Hi, by the way. Yeah, hi, Sanaxin. <laughs> Welcome to the lecture. Um, were you here the whole time or did you just arrive? Um, but indeed, indeed, pre-mRNA still has the um, introns inside of the messenger RNA. Just forgot to say, uh, that's okay, that's okay. I, it's good that you answered. So, um, yeah, so hey, mature mRNA does not have introns. Pre-mRNA still contains the introns. Um, so hey, there's this process called splicing, um, which removes them. So that's entirely correct. All right, next question, next question. What is the function of tRNA? I'm just going to do crickets again. <laughs> I have more sound effects. We can do birds. Yeah. Let's do, do birds for now. And then... Uh, So anyone can answer, like there should be six people viewing it, minus myself and my moderator, of course. Um, and then uh, we can have an answer to uh, what, what's the function of tRNA? I actually mentioned it during the lecture, I think. So. It's the link between RNA sequence and the amino sequence of proteins. Yay, very good. So tRNA is indeed, it, it, it reads the code on in the messenger RNA and it, it links it to an amino acid. So that indeed is the function of tRNA. So it's the uh, link between the RNA sequence and the, yeah, very good. All right, next question. What are the four steps in a mass spectrometry workflow slash experiment? Let me see. Um, everyone typing, typing, typing. Good. Just so that Xanaxin doesn't answer all of them. Like, Misha, come on, you know this, Misha. Get your head away from the Olympics and answer at least one of the exam, uh, example exam questions. <laughs> Stop watching the Olympics. Like, they will win the gold medals even with you not watching them. Like, no, I don't. One gold in the pocket. Okay, okay. So at least we won a gold medal. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right, so the four steps are, of course, compound separation, right? Because we have a mixture, so we need to separate the compounds. Then we need to do fragmentation and ionization. Then it is separation by mass over charge. And then it's detection. I think I'm doing it wrong. I don't have to know it, fortunately. You guys do. Um, so that's that's kind of the way that it works right so I already gave the lecture so for the lecture I read up on it um, but yeah the four steps I think are compound separation fragmentation and ionization separation using mass over charge and then I think detection so that that's kind of the four steps um, by the way I am relatively strict when it comes to numbers so if I ask you guys for three things and you write down four it is completely wrong if you write down two then you are maximally allowed to score two out of three points but it's not a guessing game right so if i say um, what are four reasons to do x 
and you write down six, then it's completely wrong. Because I'm not going to pick which four are correct and which two are wrong, or the other way around. Right? Even if all six are correct, <laughs> then because I asked for four, you did not understand the question. Extraction, separation, identification, quantification. Yeah, that's what Google says. But uh, that, that's okay. Google can say something else. I think it's more or less similar, right? Let's just scroll back quickly. So metabolites, compound separation, fragmentation and ionization, separation and detection. Yeah, see? That's okay. All right. Um, last example question. I think I had four. Name two protein purification techniques and describe how they work. So um, that that seems to be a difficult question. I don't think that I actually mentioned it here because we did have protein purification um, in the protein lecture, but I didn't. I don't. I don't think that I mentioned this. But uh, and of course, you don't have to describe now how they work because then you're typing for like 15 minutes. And uh, but and these are the kind of questions that you can expect. Right, very basic questions about the 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 lectures that we had, um, and generally I I like these twofold questions, right? So that you name them and that you quickly describe how they worked. Will the exam be oral or written? Um, what do you want it to be? Because um, I like to do a written exam. But in the Prüfungsstudiumsordnung, it says it has to be an oral exam. But then the question is, because I actually submitted a request to the exam committee to have it changed from an oral exam to a written exam, and they actually accepted that, but it's still listed in Agnes as being an oral exam while I'm actually... So it's, it's, it's probably going to be written. Because I, I think that written just makes more sense. I'm fine with either. All right, good. Um, and I think I looked at Agnes, and I think you are the only one who registered for the first period. Um, for the second period, there's actually three people registered. Um, so since you are the only one who registered for the exam next week, and the other people all registered for the makeup kind of exam or the, the second exam date, um, in your case, we can we can do whatever you want. If you say I just want to have them orally because then we're through quicker, then that would be fine with me as well. Um, but I, I will think about it and I will let you know because if two or three other people, of course, um, still register, you can do a drawing question in an oral exam. You actually can because we're doing it via Zoom. So. Xanax can sit, just sit there and make a drawing and show it like that, right? And the question is still perfectly valid, like um, draw a platypus, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter if it's written down. I can draw a puffer fish. That's a that's a that's a that's a that's a challenge. We can uh, we can look at that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm I'm still thinking about it a little bit. I think legally I could do both um, since I did get the, uh, the the okay from the exam committee to do it written but on the other side you're the only one who registered for the first date so um, we might just want to do it orally then because that's going to be a lot quicker and I can be a lot more flexible right if you write it down wrong then I have to kind of say this is wrong but if you if you just say it wrong, I can kind of sit there and do like, mm, right? So um, <laughs> we'll have to see. I will let you know. I will let you know. I will discuss also with um, the other people here um, because when we do it orally, I also need to have a secondary um, examinator there. Well, I don't need that for a written exam since I just have your written exam. Um, but I will I will let you know and I will let you know before this weekend. So I will think about it. I will discuss with my colleagues here and then I will let you know tomorrow probably. Because I think people can't register anymore for the first day. So I think they can still register for the second date but not for the first date anymore.
Anyway, it doesn't matter too much. There will be an exam next week and um, you will do perfectly fine um, because already here you had three out of four questions. So that, that's going to be going to be in the direction of like a 1.7, I think. Uh, but we'll see. So, All right. So um, that was it for today and for the whole lecture series. Um, so uh, I discussed with you guys all of the different lectures that we had. Um, also, which lectures you should not focus on learning. So it don't, don't spend too much time on the R introduction lecture. Although it's an important lecture because programming is essential, um, there won't be any programming questions on the exam. So that's it. So we're through. Um, I think in total we did 50 hours of streaming, 50 hours of lecture. Um, so I want to thank everyone that attended the, the, the Twitch streams. Um, I want to th thank you guys for, for being there. Thank you for attending the course. Um, and like I said, um, I'll mail everyone who registered for the exam with the details as soon as I get the list. Still didn't get the list. Should have gotten the list already from the Prüfungsbüro, but they're not doing. Um, and yeah, good luck on the exam. And um, I I am... I hope that everyone will pass so that we don't have to have a, a third exam date. Um, and yeah, th thank you guys so much for being here. And I hope you guys learned a lot. Of course, if you have any questions, then um, feel free to ask. And um, besides that, the uh, could we have that PowerPoint that acts as a study guide? So you mean this one? Yeah, I will, I will upload it directly. Um, I didn't... Um, upload it yet yeah no we'll do that directly um good all right then yeah thanks so much for being here um i really enjoyed it um it's nice to stream it like or to be able to do it like this at all um i miss the in-person lectures i like the in-person lectures a lot as well um but i i think this is this is as good as we can do with the current circumstances. Um, so thank you guys for, for, for being here and spending 50 hours with me um, on, on bioinformatics and all of the different topics that we discussed. Um, and uh, I will see Xanax in at least next week on the exam and the other workers slash students. Um, I will probably see them on the second exam date. And that, that's it for now. So unless anyone wants to get rid of some of their channel points slash Denny bucks and have me make a drawing, um, then I'm actually going to close the stream early for today and then uh, enjoy uh, learning for the exam and then enjoy the weekend already. All right, see you next week. Yes. And then... Uh, to all the other people that are still watching bye bye and um we will see each other on stream uh let me see let me see because i do have another date for the summer semester so streams will continue or restart um let me see So the data analysis using R course will start on 21 April. So the 21st of April, there will be a, at least probably a stream, unless I have to do it in presents or if I can do it in presents. Um, but if it's going to be online, then 21st of January, February, April, 21st of April, we will start the course. So see you then, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot, and uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>